Hi, I'm Kevin. I'm one of the pastors on staff, and hey, hello. Thanks, Paul. It's good to see you. Um, it's good to be seen. And uh, we're continuing a series in the book of Colossians. If you haven't been with us, I'm going to try and get you up to speed a little bit, because what I'm about to preach on a little later kind of kind of demands a little background. And so uh, Colossians is a book written by the Apostle Paul. I'll get comfortable here in a second. Um, and uh, he wrote it to a church that was in the first century, so there's some context that needs to be in mind as we read this. Uh, and, and as they heard it through their lens, we need to hear it through our lens. And so there's a, a uh, sense of baggage that comes with this. You need to understand that this church in Colossa, Colossae was... Um, under the Roman Empire, it's in the first century, so they understood life through that lens, that it was a predominantly male-dominated environment. Um, It was a culture that had slaves. It was a culture that um, pretty much saw women as as property. It uh, was a culture that struggled with um, power, and so they saw power as the ultimate um, understanding of of position, and, and they understood it in the context of um, Romans came in and conquered their country. So there was this sense of, okay, I come underneath the one that has the most power, and the ones with the most power set the rules. And, and so into this is in, injected God, and um, they create God in an image of power. And so Jesus now comes into this culture, and Paul's trying to explain to them, it's a different kind of God. He's a different kind of God that you've never encountered before. Because if you explain the gospel to somebody who fully uh, embraces the idea that God is purely one of power, and he makes people come under his authority, then to understand our God, to understand the God of the universe, to understand Jesus is a bit of a misnomer. It is a, a hard stretch to say that God took on flesh, came down out of glory, and walked among us, and not only did that, but did that for the sole purpose of extending grace to us, to die for us, to subjugate himself to the point of death, death on a cross, and to say, and when you heard that, if you heard that in this context of, of the Roman Empire, you would say, that's a weak God. That's a God that doesn't have power. Doesn't, he, who, what kind of God would do that? And why would I worship a God that is weak? That is the context. So Paul is now trying to speak into this culture with the message of the gospel. And so the last several weeks, we've been in, in Colossians, and we've been talking about who God is, in essence. He's been trying to explain to them that God is, is other than what you think he is, and that really, in his weakness, in his displayed weakness of going to the cross, he showed amazing strength, because in showing that strength, he conquered that which we cannot conquer, and that is death. And so there is this, he flips on its head the idea of what real authority is. And so there's this wrestling match going on in the minds of the people that read this. And and ultimately, I would argue that all of us wrestle with the same principle. We all wrestle with it on a different level. We, We wrestle with this idea of power and grace and how those two things work together. And really, and really to display power and to display authority and then put it in the context of grace, one must have the power and authority to give away grace. Do you understand that? You, you, somebody has to be the, in the position of being able to do something to you, make you um, suffer for the consequences of your sins. They have to be in that position in order to release that, and it takes more power and more authority and actually more strength to extend grace than it does to extend power. And that was the case that Paul was trying to make in the first part of this book, is he's trying to explain who Jesus is. He's trying to explain to them that Jesus is this person who, yes, he displays grace and he displays um, compassion and mercy and he wants relationship with you. He died on the cross, but yet he is the God of the universe. He is the Almighty One. He is all of those things incarnate. He is the visible vision of the invisible God. 
I, I hope you've wrestled with that over the last few weeks. I hope you've had opportunity. If you haven't heard any of the messages leading into this one, it would help for you to have context because ultimately what is born out of our understanding of God is this idea that I can then to, uh, as a result of knowing God in this way, extend forgiveness, extend mercy, be a person of compassion because now my power is, in essence, delivering that which God delivered into people's lives, rather than to try to extract it from other people. And so um, part of the reason I'm setting you up for this is because the, pa the passage we've come to in, in Colossians 3 is a passage that speaks to behavior. It speaks to what we're supposed to do. And if we don't have the underpinnings of who, what we are to believe about God and who God is, it's important. It is, I would argue, impossible to do what he's asking us to do without the power of God in us and to understand who he is. You can't do it. And so with that, so the, so the, the message this morning, if you were going to put it in a category, is it's not a doing message, it's a believing message. What do you believe is true about God? What you believe is true about God will ultimately affect your heart and ultimately affect what you do and say. And so with that, um, I want to share with you a little bit of story of what shaped my understanding of who God is. And actually, uh, this story is probably true on some level for all of us in the room. Mine's just contextualized. But you all were raised in a home, whether it's the, your home of origin or you were adopted or you lived in an orphanage, it doesn't matter. You were shaped by it. Something happened to you. Your heart was, was molded in that environment. And as it was molded in that environment, you began to understand who God was by the basis of who the authority was in your life. Because God is the ultimate authority. We learn authority by the people that are in our lives. So if you grew up in an environment that was highly permissive, you see God as highly permissive. If you, see, if you grew up in one that was highly disciplined, you see God as highly disciplined. And it's part of the wrestling match. It's part of us trying to discard that which we think is true about about God for what is really true about God. And so we need to align with God in order for this to happen. So a little bit of my upbringing um, contextually, I grew up, I was the youngest of four kids, grew up in northern Minnesota. And so snow was a big part of my life. Um, much to my chagrin, now I live in Tennessee and I'm happy. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's really funny when people say it's gonna snow here. It's not, uh, it doesn't snow here. <laughs> it might flurry a little bit, but that's not snow. Um, and I grew up in a place where usually we had snow for, from Halloween until sometime in April. Um, <laughs> thinking about it now makes me sad. Um, <laughs> I, I wonder why people live there. But that's, uh, I'm on a tangent. I'm on a really tangent there. That's not where I want to go with this. All right. So, and part of the deal was I lived in a home where my dad was the king of the castle. And literally at times would call himself the king. And, uh, and we, were, we were the subjects to the king. And uh, we lived in a very modest little ranch house and, and we had a driveway. And uh, I had two older brothers, we were all about a year apart, and I had an older sister who was, was never mind. So the three of us, <laughs> the three of us were um, kind of the uh, muscle for the king. So um, he would, he, he kind of, decided at some point, and I don't know how old I was, I was 10 or 11, I was somewhere in that area. I don't remember all the details, but I remember a lot of it. So this is, this is what happened one night. So the deal was is that we were supposed to have the, shove, the driveway cleared by the time my dad got home from work. That was the deal. And so, and it snowed often, so we were shoveling often. And, and so one night, uh, for whatever reason, it, it must have snowed a little later, and my dad worked late, and he got home late, and we were all in bed. And I, I, what I remember is being rustled out of bed. I remember being rustled out of bed and taken into the kitchen, where we were ceremoniously, the three of us, given a lecture about the driveway is supposed to be clear when I get home from work. Great. I'm still trying to wake up and realize that I just got taken out of bed and was standing in the, in the kitchen. And this was a loud conversation. Apparently, my dad had had a bad day at work. It doesn't really matter. But so we, we stood there and, and uh, got told that we were supposed to. So it was, eh, it was probably around 11.30, 11, 11.30 at night. And you know what you're like when you wake up. You know, you're dead asleep, and you're kind of like, I remember half of this. And so me and my brothers go outside, get dressed. And getting dressed when it's 10 degrees outside is a, is a project. Um, 
so we, no kidding. So we went outside, shoveled for an hour, and uh, my dad had gone to bed, was fast asleep, and my mom was waiting up for us, was in the kitchen, which wasn't unusual, and she had made us some hot chocolate, and now we're wide awake, you know? You can go outside in 10 degree weather and shovel for an hour, you're wide awake. And, uh, and we, we were originally decided we were gonna watch some TV because we never really got to stay up this late. So um, my mom talked us out of that because that would have further inflamed the problem. And so she made us some hot chocolate. We sat around talking. I remember one of my brothers saying, Mom, I don't get this. I don't get why it is the way it is. Why, why do we have to get out of bed and shovel? And why is it like this? And my mom's answer was, it's just it's your dad trying to make sure that he has, he's, you guys respect him and have a, his authority and you come under his authority. And it had been just as easy to get up in the morning and, you know, we were on a, we were whining now at this point because we're all like 11, 12, and 13 years old. And uh, then my older brother said very intuitively, and I hadn't thought of this, was, you know, Mom, I don't get it. We have a snowblower in our dr garage <laughs> that only one person can use. The three of us weren't allowed to use it. And he could have he could have done it in 15 minutes and she just she she said talking about exasperating talking about a moment in time that shapes your heart i hadn't realized it up until that point I put those pieces together because we weren't really allowed to ask questions and we weren't it was it was one of those moments when i realized oh oh this is not about us shoveling the driveway it's about something else and it was about him exercising power over us, which he had masterfully done. Um, and so at the end of the day, I share that with you because it shaped my heart a little bit, and a lot actually. And so all of us in our, in our upbringing years, when we were grown, somebody shaped our hearts like that. And so I take that experience and I apply it to God, right? I say, okay, is, is God like that? Is that how he kind of, is he, is he manipulating me? Is he trying to exercise his authority over me? And so I had to recalibrate in my heart, relearn, re-understand, however you want to put it. I had to put aside my image of God, what I had made up in my mind, and what I had experienced as authority, and apply what the Bible says is God and his authority. And all of us have to do that. All of us have that crept in to our theology, to our understanding of who God is, because it's our experience. And, it, and scripture is really kind of clear about this. This is a mirror of the, of the relationship with God is really a father, right? A father figure. And as he is called father, we kind of, you know, for some of you are going, oh no. Um, if you're a father in the room, it does seem to kind of place a little weight on you. And if you start reflecting on your father, you go, no, so I got to rethink some of this. And, and honestly, as your mind, you have to retrain your mind. You have to retrain what you think. You have to discard that which is not true of God and replace it with what is true of God or else it's really difficult, it's really difficult to see God in the light that he is. And so it's the same thing with these people in Colossians. In the, it, the letter is written to them so that they would readjust, realign their idea of what authority is. They would realign with their idea of who God is and they would align it with this God, God of the Bible, the God uh, who died for them, the God who sacrificed for them, the God who extended forgiveness and mercy. And so not just so that they could experience the fullness of God, not just so you can experience the fullness of God, not just so I can experience the fullness of God, but so that ultimately the people who encounter me can experience God through me. Therein lies the challenge. Therein lies the difficulty. Therein lies the, the brokenness of family. Now, I want to tell you that I learned a lot of great things from my dad. And he influenced me in a lot of great ways. But he also influenced me in some ways that are head scratchers that I had to figure out, that I had to change. But I have that vivid memory. If you have one, it probably is stuck there. It's, it's probably something that you had to adjust or move on. 
So, so your life experiences, my life experiences, all those things shape the way that we view God. Same thing with these people that were listening to uh, Paul or reading this letter. So I want to share with you a few verses just leading into what I'm going to talk about in just a minute. Um, some quotes from, from Colossians that, that I think speak to this idea of recalibrating or rethinking God. And the first one in chapter one is this. We continually, this is Paul speaking, he says, we continually ask God, now listen, to fill you, the readers of this, with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. It always begins with understanding. It begins with this place where you begin to go, okay, I need knowledge, I need to understand who God is. And, and with that comes understanding and wisdom, and it changes then, it leads to the way we live. If we don't have the right understanding and we don't have the right knowledge, we can't live the right life. We can't do it. And so the wisdom of God is to say, and that's what really these first few pages of this letter is, is that you need to understand who God is before you can live it out. So knowledge and understanding and wisdom come before living the life. And then in chapter two, verse nine, it says this, for in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. Love that phrase. Because it now, it, it quantifies for the, the readers and for us is that he is the power and authority over everything and he is the fullness of the deity. So deity in their mind, they fully grasp the idea of God and the fully idea, full idea of, of, of the idea that this God was above all the other gods because Romans really believed in multiple gods. And so you get this, this idea that he's trying to erode away what their understanding of God was so that he could replace it with the truth. And you need to do the same. I need to do the same on a regular basis. If I, if I have a misunderstanding of who God is, it will play out in my life. If you misunderstand something about God, this is the journey you're on. This is the path that you're on. And if there's something that you believe that is, that is not true about God, it will reflect, it will present, it will show up in the way that you live. Easily d- diagnosable, difficult if you're sitting in the seat to see. It's hard to diagnose yourself. Then he says in verse 20 of chapter two, since you died with Christ... So there's this, now he's moved them into this idea of, of relationship and he's trying to move them away from the spiritual forces that they previously worshiped. He says, since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why do you live as though you still belong to them? So there is this movement, he's, he's, he's now challenging the way that they think and they believe and said, since this has happened, since you've come to follow Jesus, why are you still living as though you belong to the world? Why do you still live that way? That's the question. That is the struggle. And, and so your allegiance, my allegiance has changed. We've moved. So. And then ver- chapter 3, verse 12, it says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, this, that, hear those words. Hear those words because it, it speaks to God's motivation and it speaks to who God is and it speaks to who we are. Very short just a a snippet of phrase, but it is powerful. As God's chosen people, people that he he loves dearly, a holy God, chosen people, love dearly. We get his motive, we get his personality, we get get a picture of who he is, and that we're in relationship with him. Wow. And if you're, if you're reading this for the first time, you're going, okay, that's different because all the gods that I've worshipped before just wanted to extract something from me. They want something from me. This is a God that wants something for us. He's turned it on its head. He says this, now clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. <laughs> and if you're hearing in a power structure that says, um, I need to take what I need and what is worshipped is aggression and what is worshipped is having the most toys and what is worshipped is being on top of the heap. And he says, clothe yourself with compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. 
He's, again, do you see? It's turned on its head. Bear with each other and forgive one another. And, and if any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. That's not how it works. That's not how life works. If, if somebody has a grievance, I leverage it. I use it to my advantage. I can manipulate. Forgiveness is weakness. And he's saying we, forgiveness is the ultimate form of strength. And so it's Jesus led by example, right? Our God led by example. So we have this picture. We have this version of God that isn't manipulative. We have this version of God that is, is motivated by love, unconditional love, not conditional love. We have this, this picture of God that's forgiving and compassionate and kind. And, and we sometimes confuse our understanding of who God is because we are trying to ultimately find a way to control God to get what we want, so we try to work the angles, and we then walk away from our understanding of God saying, he doesn't really love me because he doesn't give me what I want. Okay, so that's a wrong belief about God, and it's an inaccurate picture of who you are. And when those two things collide, oftentimes what happens is we go down the wrong path. Our journey is marred in this place of meandering in the wilderness. See, God gave us a glimpse of himself through Jesus. He gives away that which only he possesses, and that is the power of forgiveness and grace. And he comes at it from a position of great authority and he wants us to experience all of it. And now what I'm about to do is read for you part of chapter three, which is set up by that notion, okay? If you just turn to chapter three and you start reading chapter three of Colossians, you will find yourself reading a list of things that you ought to do. And if you don't understand what you ought to believe before you start doing what you ought to do, it becomes what I would call legalism or duty because now I'm in relationship with God and he requires these things of me. And if he requires these things from me and I don't do it out of my relationship with him and motivated out of a heart that is overflowing in this direction because of what he's done for me, I do it so that I gain what I want from him. We can read this list of things that we ought to do and say I ought to do them because then God will be happy with me or God will do what I want or God will and we use it from a position of leverage to get God on our side. That's the wrong vantage point. God's on your side already. God is on your side. God is for you. God has extended grace to you. He has, he has died on a cross for you. He's for you. He loves you unconditionally. So, so to put that cart before this one messes up the whole idea of where this comes from. What we ought to do, the life that we ought to live is directly correlated with our deep understanding of who God is. And if our deep understanding of God is is that he's for me, he's not angry with me, he's not trying to manipulate me, he merely wants me to live a life that reflects who he is, then I begin to understand why he puts this list of things because now it becomes the template by which I can now see where I'm aligning and where I'm not aligning. Okay, where I'm aligning and where I'm not aligning. All right, there's going to be some words that I'm about to read that are going to make some of the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. And when that happens, I want you to make note of that word because culturally we've destroyed some of these words. All right, sorry, here we go. Colossians chapter 3, I drew the short straw when Jamie left. (laughs) Okay, okay. Colossians chapter 3, starting with verse 17. And verse 17 is key, okay? And whatever you do, whether in word or or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So there it is. There is the preference to about what I'm about to read. Verse 18. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it. 
not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. There it is. There is a list of things that we ought to do. And I'm, I, I'm going to preface this, and I'm just going to go down this path just a tad, because I think... For some of us in the room, the, the, the flag word was slaves. And, and I want to make sure that, yeah, I'm, um, slavery's wrong. Slavery is not something that uh, scriptures, the scriptures advocate. This is a case of a church that had slaves attending it and masters attending it. Think about that for just a minute. The slaves and the masters were in the same congregation. They were in the same gathering. And he speaks to both of them. And he speaks to both of them. And culturally, slavery was a little different than what we conjure up in our head. It's wrong. It was ownership of people. But in the same breath, they lived in their houses. It was usually to pay off a debt that they could not pay. And so they lived with the house and they paid it off and then they were set free. But still could be used, could be abused, could be, could be, uh, and probably were because of the way it was set up in the Roman context. So I, but what I want you to hear in this is that he speaks to both. He speaks to the slave and he speaks to the master. And contextually, probably for us, what works best is probably in the context of work. So hear it in, in the terms of working. And he, and he qualifies this really well, I think. Whatever you do, verse 23, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. So every time you come to that place where you're like, man, I, I just hate my boss and I don't want to work hard for him. He's, he's trying to move you to a place. This is a heart issue, okay? The heart issue is I'm not really appropriating really what, what I should be doing is, is that I should be reflecting God in my work. But that's not really where I want to dwell, but I wanted to qualify that so that everybody, I want to move through a couple of other things <laughs> in this passage that probably are speaking or, or causing you a little bit of angst or um, wondering how it works itself out. And, and the first word I want, uh, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. I find it very fascinating that he leads with that and he doesn't lead with husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. And I also want to put this in context for you. And, and the context, again, is first century Roman Empire. First century being very much so male-dominated, um, and he and and wives, generally speaking, were considered very much so like property. And so, with that comes this weird statement. I think it's weird. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. In that culture, it would probably be very unusual to see a wife that didn't. And so, why do that? Why do that in that in that? phrase and state it just like that. And I would argue because it's probably a heart issue more than it is a behavior issue. And I also want to say that that word submit and submission and that word in, in and of itself has huge baggage with it because of our culture. And we, we live in a Western culture. Men and women are considered equal. Um, and, I, and I think in, in previous churches that I've attended and also hearing my mom talk about it and growing up Baptist and, and I think it was used by some men as a weapon in their relationship with their wives. Gave them excuse to abuse them. Gave them excuses to be harsh, harsh with them. Gave them um, a way to beat them down. That's not what this is talking about. Um, I I find this word very difficult because culturally it has moved to a place where it just makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. And I don't think that's what God intended it to do when he first put it in scriptures was to make the... Okay, so let's take it out of this context for just a second. Let's take this idea of submission out of the context of husband and wife and move it, I, I, move it into just this idea of authority. 
I think a lot of times we culturally, this is our problem culturally, is authority. I grew up in the 60s and 70s. One of the great problems with the 70s was the desire to be out from underneath the control of authority. And it was rebellion. And rebellion was just that. And, and it, it migrated into the family. It migrated into government. It migrated into, and we're seeing the fruition of it today. We are seeing the full on um, cultural ramifications of authority has no place. And, and so we find ourselves kind of in this uh, what do we, the, the genie's out of the bottle, right? The, what do we do with that? I, I want to tell you this about, about submission in the husband and wife relationship in the Western culture. I believe wholeheartedly from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, it's, the, it's a very similar passage of scripture um, that says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. He says it to the husband and wife, submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. And every, every man in every situation and every understanding of mine of understanding what it means to love our wives is to defer to them and to serve them and to love them like Christ loved the church. That's the standard by which we are to enter into relationships with our wives. Um, oftentimes, we don't do that. We expect and we demand and we, we treat them unfairly and then we, we find ourselves in a place where we end up being harsh, cruel, mean, unforgiving. So at the end of the day, I believe that the culture that we live in demands something of us both in this realm of submission. Because we live in a, a culture in which women are not property and, and won't be. They have the same rights and are equal to us in every way. And so how does that translate into a marriage? How does that translate in, into a relationship where you live with someone and it's to display, display our understanding of who God is? If I understand it right, my role in that is to love my wife sacrificially. And that looks a lot like submission. And if we are to mutually submit or defer to one another, it changes the culture and climate of the environment of the home. It's less about who's got the power and who's manipulating who, and it's more about who serves who. And I believe that is ultimately what he's shooting for here. And so if he was to say it to our culture, if he was to write this letter in a way that we would grasp it and wrestle with it um, and, and say, what does Christ look like in my relationship at my home? Is he would say, love each other like I love you. Love each other unconditionally. Grace prevails. Mercy prevails. Compassion and kindness prevails. And then what you get is, you know, children, obey your parents and everything, for this pleases the Lord. That sounds a lot like the Ten Commandments. It sounds like a do thing. But in the context of a, of a family that is, is Christ-centered, and there's deference to one another, and there's service of one another, and there is um, children obeying your parents and everything becomes probably pretty normal. because there is an understanding of grace. There's an understanding of mercy. And, and you know, maybe your mind went there already, but Kevin, there's gotta be rules, there's gotta be parameters, there's gotta be, there's gotta be discipline, there's gotta be punishment, there's gotta be all of those things. And, and I would argue, okay, in your relationship with God, okay, now I wanna draw you back. I want to draw you back to where the premise comes from. The first part of this book is all about us aligning with God. And so in our alignment with God, we, we come into this relationship and is the predominant thing that he says to us is there's rules and here's the rules that you have to live by. These are, this is the, no, what he says is I love you and I want to have a relationship with you. That's what he says. He says, now there's things that you should do and you shouldn't do. And everything is permissible, but not everything is advisable. And so when you start getting into the camp of not advisable, there's going to be consequences. 
painful consequences, and sometimes administered by a parent, but sometimes just administered by the culture you live in. And so there's this, there's a, a, a full breadth of understanding that the relationship I have with God is he doesn't govern us by rules. He governs us by relationship. And that's what he's describing here. He says, I want you to have a relationship with me that it, my authority spills over into your life, not so I can lord it over you, but that you can be transformed into the likeness of me and that you would embrace this idea that I love you unconditionally, that you experience my forgiveness, you experience my grace, you experience my mercy, you experience my compassion, you have relationship with me, I am giving you eternal life, I'm bringing you into my kingdom, I am your God, you are my people, I am your father, you are my children, and in that relationship is this, is that you carry forward the very DNA of God. I mean, when you get outside of the bounds of what is protective, it's painful. <laughs> Ask any child that gets out of the protective net of their parents and willfully rebels against their authority, there's pain. Unequivocally, there is pain. Why? Because <laughs> they weren't meant to be out from underneath the covering of their parent. We weren't meant to be out of the covering of our father. See, I, here's the struggle. i uh, trying to talk about something in 30 minutes that should be five hours. Um, <laughs> keep going, yeah, <laughs> just, just keep talking. Yeah, yeah, and I'll get, Brentwood will call me on Monday. What were you doing with all those cars in the street? waiting to get parking spots. Here's the, here's the piece that I want you to wrestle with with me, is that when you hear those words of, of I should submit or I should not be harsh or I should not, and you read that for the, do you, do, where does your mind go? Just sit there for a second and think about where does my mind go? My mind goes, my wife should treat me better or my, somebody in that list needs to read this. It wasn't meant to be read that way. It wasn't meant so that you could give it to your spouse and say, see, you're not supposed to be harsh with me. See, you're supposed to submit to me. Come on, kid, read that. You're supposed to obey me. God says so. That isn't what was meant to be. What was meant to be is as I read that and I see my name, Kevin, do not treat your wife harshly. That's, that's about me and God and the motive behind why I treat my wife the way I treat her. Um, one last illustration. Band, come up, please, or also keep talking. So band, keep, keep coming. <laughs> one, one, last, one last thing. I was listening to a podcast this week and uh, driving me crazy. It, it was on the, I, I say this wrong all the time, um, and I don't want to say it that way. <laughs> Enneagram. It was about the Enneagram. I, I usually say something else. So, um, and and this guy was explaining his who he was in this number that he was. It doesn't matter what number he was, and it doesn't matter it because it was as he was being interviewed and he was talking. He goes, "I have you." And the interviewer said, "Do you ever come across harsh to people? Are you mean to people? Are you, you know, down the line?" Oh yeah, people perceive me that way all the time, but it's not really the motive of my heart. It's not. I'm just trying to help them, and and I and I become overbearing. I become this, and I wanted to jump through the whatever means by which to get to that guy, <laughs> and say, if people are telling you that you're harsh and mean and overbearing, and it's a consistent theme throughout your life. It's not them. <laughs> it's probably you. So, it, and if, if you are, if somebody says to you, oh, you're always manipulative, and you're always coming around the bend, and, you're, and, and, and you have a hard time in relationships because of that, and you say, yeah, but you don't understand. I was just trying to spare your feelings. I'm trying to, and, and the it's not them. 
it's you. See, this is the problem. We want people to be able to read our motives and we want people to be able to read our minds and we want people to be able to say, I'm just being harsh with you because you're not listening to me. See, no matter what caveat you put on the end of that, there's a heart problem because now you're not dealing with that person in the way that actually God would deal with them. And so you're not aligning with God, you're aligning with your own person, and you're saying, read my mind, read my motive, and now I get to deal with you any way I want. It doesn't work. It blows up families, and it destroys relationship, because the motive behind it is, I want to be known in the way I want to be known, rather than I want you to know the God that I worship who died for me. Those are two different things. And so this week, as you wrestle with what I'm telling you and what the scriptures are telling you and what you hear in your voice and if you hear in your head is, I need to look at how I see God because what comes out of me is not compassion. It is not patience. It is not, especially with the people I live with, the people that know me the best. They should see the sweet heart of God in me. So how do I need to align with God so that my peoples can see the sweet heart of God? Let's pray. Dear Jesus, forgive us when we wrestle with this and, and we want to just make people understand. May we look inside and align and know that you're working in us and you're telling us over and over again, may we just trust what we're hearing that I'm harsh. I, I probably need to stop being harsh. I'm manipulative. I probably need to stop being manipulative. I need to align with you because you're never manipulative with us and you're never harsh with us. And, and Lord, may we love each other well and may we discard those things that are not true about you and replace them with things that are true and may we forgive freely and may we extend grace freely and may we just extend these things into the very home we live and may we be reminded that you are a good father, that you are a great father, that you love us and you extended yourself and you en encroached upon our place so that we might know life and know your kingdom and may we get there one step at a time as you reveal these things to us and we align with you. In Jesus' name, amen. And as you hear these next few songs, you can sit, you can stand, but I really want you to hear from God. We trust that God is gonna speak to you through his word, through this music, through prayer. We trust that, and the people in your life. You're gonna hear from them. So if there's a reoccurring theme, wrestle with that today. Wrestle with it. Let's sing.